Okay, so we are moving on to, I just wanted to kind of go over a couple of things from the last lecture before we get into lecture two. I'm just gonna show you guys this, not that. All right, so I'm just gonna share this video really quickly. This is a woman who worked with the man who uh, came up with the overkill hypothesis in 1970. And we're just gonna listen to her very quickly. Whether we wanna be or not, this is our culture, this is our roots. I work with a scientist by the name of Paul Martin, who in the 1960s came up with the overkill hypothesis. And that is that he was positing that instead of some sort of climate change at the end of the ice ages, that was the reason that the saber-toothed tigers and the mammoths and the mastodons and the ground sloths and many other creatures went, went extinct, that instead of it climate change, that it was humans, frontier humans, not Native Americans, but the first humans to come across the Bering Land Bridge into North America frontiers people before they learn to become native, before the creatures learn to deal with us. This was the overkill hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that about 13,000 years ago, this is why we have all the animals that go out. The Clovis culture, the, the so-called mammoth hunters with the large spear points, these were the ones. And the, those spear points are seen all over North America, and they went out over the course of about 300 years. It's about how long it took for this trophic cascade of, distinct, of extinction to happen. It wasn't something that we wanted to hear, right? That people could do this? It's only Western industrial people that are bad. We're the ones causing the sixth major mass extinction. What's happened since the 1960s is that glaciologists have discerned that the glaciers came down and moved back and came down and moved back, never quite as far as where we are now in Kentucky, but came down and moved back 22 different times. The only difference from this interglacial, that is warm period, from previous interglacials is that there's one new animal now, and that's the human. What also um, sustained them in this is that they found where everywhere in the world when humans moved out of Africa and particularly moved into outlying areas, not Europe and not Asia, but outlying areas with technology in which they could kill effectively at a distance, mass extinction, not mass extinction, extinction of the massive occurred. Do you get the difference? The big creatures began here in Australia, correlated with the first humans. Those of you in the front, you can see silhouettes of the large creatures here. Nine out of every 10 genus, genera, of large creatures went extinct in Australia when the first people showed up. And their dingoes, and the dogs that they brought with them. Correlation, not necessarily cause, but correlation. Into the Mediterranean islands, do you know there used to be dwarf hippos and dwarf elephants and mastodons on all of the Mediterranean islands? Correlated when the first charcoal of humans showing up with the boating technology to move into the Mediterranean islands, that's when these creatures go out, around 10,000 years ago for many of them. Here's something with North America. Cuba's part of North America, right? Cuba did not lose its giant ground sloths until 6,000 years ago, in contradistinction to 13,000 years ago in mainland North America. This is a big reason why the climatologists have a difficult time explaining that, oh, it was climate that took out the animals. And then, just about eight years ago, scientists studied the mammoth tusks on an island to the north of Siberia, quite a ways offshore to the north of Siberia, and at that time, when they studied radiometric dating, they said, oh my gosh, these mammoths went extinct only 4,000 years ago. Correlated when the first humans showed up. Moving over to Madagascar, off the coast of Africa, 2,000 years ago, this one is just the correlation is more its absolute cause. Not only the, um, the giant elephant bird, but the uh, lemur, there was a lemur that was so large, the size of a gorilla, it could no longer climb trees. It was ground-based. 
And tortoises the size of our Galapagos tortoises went out when the first peoples came to Madagascar. Hawaii, 1,500 years ago, when the Polynesians came with their pigs for the first time, all the flightless birds went out, a stunning variety of ibises and ducks and geese that were flightless went out at that time. Finally, 800 years ago, New Zealand, with the ancestors of the Maori people, the moa and the biggest eagle of all time. This eagle was able to actually kill an adult moa by breaking its neck with, its, with landing on its feet. These went out, as well as some other things on the island of New Zealand. That's the depressing part. That's what Earth teaches us when we open our eyes and open our ears to be willing to listen to bad news, things that we don't want to hear, things that are counterintuitive. This is the kind of thing we hear. It's very depressing in a way. This is what humans do. Any time that we enter a place where the creatures that did not co-evolve with us had never experienced another creature that could kill at a distance, that is thrown spears. Good news of this is that our culture, where we come from, Western industrial culture, is doing the same thing that humans have always done when it enters a frontier landscape with new technology. And when you increase your technology and have a new technology, that means even if you stay in your landscape, it's a frontier landscape again, right? New All right. So I was just wanted to share that and uh, share that video because uh, it's, it sort of gets a little bit better at the idea of uh, the overkill hypothesis. Now, um, I can't say any, I can't say much about all of her points, but I did look up some information about uh, some of her points, what she was talking about on some of those things. Yeah, I did look in, up information for some of those points. And um, what we're gonna look at in this case is so the woolly mammoth that she was talking about. And I guess I gotta stop and share this because I wanted to share this other one. Um, so the woolly mammoth that she was talking about that went extinct on the island, well, it's actually, uh, it's very interesting because what they, what they, uh, what, and obviously that, that video is about, is about like 10 years old. So, um, hopefully she sort of kept up on the research, but what I found was that those mammoths that went extinct were actually very genetically inbred. What most likely happened was that during one of these uh, glacial periods, mammoths crossed over to this island via a land bridge. And then when the sea levels rose again, they were isolated on this small island. And they ended up inbreeding and kind of wrecked their DNA. So uh, there was a number of things that they found, like they couldn't even smell flowers. Uh, they were having problems reproducing, et cetera. So it might not have been necessarily the humans that caused that to happen. And when it comes to, when it comes to Madagascar, like I mentioned before, there's still, there's still a lot of there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of debate on Madagascar's influence and uh, Malagasy influence on megafauna extinctions. We know that they were part of the cause, but we're not sure how much um, I guess blame to assign to those people back then. But climate change did hit Madagascar as well, most likely in the form of increased drought and changes in the environment. Today, on to lecture two, today we will be talking about indigenous science or as it's known in um, another terminology, 
the idea of uh, traditional ecological knowledge, basically what did indigenous people, people know? And this is just an outline of the talk. We're gonna discuss uh, what is indigenous science and then we're gonna discuss uh, species discoveries and the scientific concepts and the management techniques that indigenous people knew about and used. And this is just sort of um, foundational information because I never learned about this kind of stuff when I was in undergraduate uh, and undergraduate. And I think that it would be important for us to know that Western science didn't actually discover every single thing that occurred in the ecological field. Okay, what is indigenous science? It is a cumulative body of knowledge, practice and belief regarding the environment, humans, and how humans and the environment relate to each other. The characteristics are that indigenous science or trad traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, um, or local indigenous, uh, local ecological knowledge, LEK, there's a number of acronyms for it, but the characteristics of indigenous science is that it tends to be locale specific. It tends to be focused on the land that indigenous people know of. So in any wit will probably not be well versed on the environment of, on the environment that a Mubuti might be versed in. Um, Mubuti live in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Inuit, of course, live in Northern North America. So they would know their locations, but um, they would know their locations very well. So it would be more of a sense of indigenous science being focused on depth and not breadth necessarily. It's abstract. And it is adaptive. And this is probably because of the tens of thousands and thousands of years that indigenous people have, usually on their landscape. Um, they know that the environment changes and ecosystems change and they sort of know how to roll with the punches. It is passed through cultural means, things like taboos, totems, stories, legends, myths, and just general social customs, ways of being and acting, and is also based on experience and observation. So like any other science. Just to go into what indigenous people know and the, I, the fact that they are the original natural historians, uh, the Stitmac uh, in British Columbia. Um, this is just a quote from Turner et al. 2000. It says that people were very familiar with the foods of animals, so dietary studies, and often use their observations to enhance their own diets. For the Huna Tsinglit in Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve, Hun et al. 2003 mentioned that they had a sophisticated appreciation for the nesting biology and behavior of the Galakas wing gull, and this helped them in their sustainable use of this gull's eggs. So what the Huna found was that if a goal has laid three eggs, you cannot take any eggs from the nest because the goal will not lay anymore. And later on, scientists, uh, Western scientists confirmed this. They learned that the reproductive, the reproductive biology sort of just shuts down after this goal has laid three eggs. But if you have a nest that has one or two eggs, you can take out as many as you want, basically. And the goal will continue laying eggs as long as it's able and until it hits that magical number three. And so they use this information to sustainably access this resource of food from this animal. And this information was just sort of passed on as a custom. It was this proverb, it was this rule, um, uns unspoken or spoken, but unarguable rule of if there's an egg or two in the nest, you could harvest some of them 
but if there's three, leave the bird alone. You got the Vezo and the Sara and the Tenolana in Southern Madagascar. They know when animals are active, so activity patterns, patterns of habitat, habitation and behavior, including food eaten, such as, so things that Western scientists tend to use a lot of resources to get at and understand about these animals. Um, of course, the indigenous people know through observation. Yeah, fishers in Northeastern Brazil, which had knowledge of temporal distributions of fishes. So where fishes would be during the day, whether they will be further down in the water column or whether they would be in the shallows. And basically indigenous people know a lot about their environment. So they'll know species habit habitat associations, they'll know predator prey interactions, they'll know phenology, the timing, the seasonal timing of occurrences like mating seasons or flowering seasons, they'll know species diets. And in particular, they'll know what species are present in an area. So when you think about species discoveries and how Western scientists tend to enjoy saying that we've discovered this species, um, you'll notice that very, it's not very often that they mention that local people might have helped them or more than likely knew that the animal was in the area before Western scientists um, acknowledged it. I'm just gonna show a couple of videos. Welcome to One Planet Conservation Awareness. And we hope that you've all had a wonderful Christmas despite these strange times. Today, we're gonna to be bringing to the species. Yeah, sure, Jordan, thanks. So, um, Sala, it's not just a it's not just a new species of large mammal. They, they weigh about uh, eighty to one hundred kilos. It's an entirely new scientific genus, and it was completely unknown to the outside world until nineteen ninety two, and it was discovered in Vietnam during a general biological survey, and it was probably the most surprising zoological find of the twentieth century. I mean, no, no, it blew the minds of biologists around the world. Nobody believed that an animal this large and this distinctive could go undetected in the closing years of the 20th century, especially in a you know, fairly densely human populated country like Vietnam. Um, you know, what it's where, you know, 28 years or so after that discovery, we don't know a lot more about it. Um, we know it's still out there, but this is the largest animal of certain existence that's probably never been seen in the wild by a biologist. You know, we have a handful of camera trap photographs of it. We've seen some animals that were kept kind of in ad hoc captivity for a short time uh, before they died. Uh, we've seen some dead ones. Um, we're still getting very convincing villager reports of uh, sightings of it. Um, but most of what we know about this animal has come from talking to villagers in its range. Nobody's yet seen it in the wild um, who's a biologist or a scientist. So yeah, it's this incredible mystery. Um, that's in part. So uh, this man mentions that the Saula is this new species. It was discovered by Western scientists in 1992. And he mentions that um, no scientist has seen it in the wild and that they get all their information from local villagers. And it's this idea of locals not being scientists or biologists when it comes to animals in their area. Uh, this, I got a quote from a PDF from a WWF workshop on the animal, the Sala. And it says that much of the information has come from the local people in its range. And this is a list, just a list of a short sample of the kind of information that local people have been able to give conservation organizations and science, Western scientists. So you have seasonal movements up and down mountains, seasonal migrations, you have use of mineral licks, so habitat associations, plants selected for diet, the timing of breeding seasons, and how many individuals uh, females have when they uh, give birth. They have territorial marking paper. This is all information that a scientist who studies an animal would presumably know. So in this way, locals are the scientists in this case. 
Here we have another video on the coelacanth. And just in case you don't know what that is, it's a giant fish. And it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be extinct for the past 65 million years. And then um, I think it was an English person or a British person that uh, re rediscovered it in the 30s, I wanna say. I might have that year wrong, but just a minute. So again, we have this um, species that was supposedly rediscovered by a Western scientist in the 30s. And it was rediscovered because a local fisher happened to pull it up in its um, in his nets, in his fishing nets. And so the locals were familiar with this fish and they had been familiar with the fish. They didn't know that it was supposed to be um, this extinct animal. Uh, it was locally known by, as Mame or Gumbesta. Um, and the fish would get on, uh, fishers would get it on their lines every now and again. So they didn't know that it was supposed to be extinct and they knew of this animal. So you can't really say that the Western scientists that supposedly rediscovered it actually rediscovered it. And, okay, here we go, another video. This is a kipunji, first discovered in 2005 and never filmed before. In looks and behavior, the new monkey resembles a manga bee. But its DNA is similar to a baboon's. For now, the evolutionary origins of the charismatic Kapunji remain shrouded in mystery. Kipunjis are particularly fond of this sticky orange cucumber fruit, which sprouts from vines in the treetops. They're known to feed on over 100 different plants and play a crucial role in dispersing their seeds. But even while scientists begin to uncover their secret lives, Kipunjis are teetering on the verge of extinction. As the isolated forests around Mount Rungwe are cleared for farming and firewood, the Kipunjis' unique forest habitat is shrinking. 
With a mere thousand individuals remaining in the wild, they are already the rarest monkeys in Africa. There may be. Okay, so uh, one thing that is pretty interesting about that idea of um, them being threatened due to the locals is the I, the fact, not idea, but fact that uh, it was due to the locals that this animal was even known to science in the first place. So what happened was the locals would talk about this animal, the Kapunji, and they would say it was, you know, it's a different monkey. It's a totally different monkey. It's unique and you need to come see it. And the Western scientists that were in that area went along with it and they were totally sure that it was just going to be an imaginary animal or that the local hunters had uh, mistaken it or misidentified it for a species that everyone already knew of but um, it turns out that it was an entirely new species and so it was because of these locals that that video said was a threat to them that the animals even discovered. And this is just a, a sampling of species discoveries that occurred due to locals. There's um, a review that went over new discoveries of primate species from the 1980s onward. And I could only find a review for primates. I couldn't find any reviews for anything else, unfortunately. But what they found was that 40%, nearly half of the primate species that were rediscovered or discovered was because of locals. And almost 75% of these newly discovered species had some sort of indirect evidence about their, present, uh, their presence before they were discovered by Western science. So when I'm talking about indirect evidence, I'm saying that the locals had names for this animal um, that the locals had seen the animal, of course, and had mentioned it to Western scientists. Uh, the locals possibly had pelts or the remains of the animal, but it's not until Western scientists say that it's actually a new species that, and that it actually exists, that it seems the species um, does not exist until then. Okay. And even beyond species discovery, you have this field called ethnopharmacology, which is pharmacists, pharmaceutical companies. It's largely pushed by pharmaceutical companies. Um, basically investigating traditional medicine, mining traditional medicine for pharmacological purposes. So one example is aspirin. It comes from salicin from willows, and it's been known to be a pain reliever and a fever reliever since Egypt and Assyria. In North America, indigenous people used it. It was like a, it was like um like a band-aid uh, in a first aid box or a first aid kit that you would purchase at CVS or your local drugstore. It was one of those things that was just in all medicine kits. Um, but you also have this example of uh, so the soil bacteria called Mycobacterium vasae. Uh, it comes from Uganda, and the locals are the ones that told researchers about its powers. They said that this mud muddy substance in this certain district of Uganda was um, very powerful and it could heal all sorts of things. And it's now being researched as a treatment for things like cancer, depression, um, eczema, uh, it's just a whole list of ailments that it's being researched for, leprosy. And the, pro the, the po problem is, is that the locals that sort of helped with the discovery and the locals that are the ones that are giving this knowledge to pharmaceutical companies, they're often not paid for the, paid for the information or paid for the discovery not in the sense that they don't have a stake in any medicines that come out of this information and the sales of those medicines. So this pharmaceutical company could make a billion dollars off of this uh, bacteria that they found thanks to the locals, 
but the locals will never see a cent of that money. And so it's important that we understand that um, locals often know a lot more about an environment than Western scientists do. And it's important that we give credit to indigenous people for their knowledge as well. So I don't know how many of you guys use Wikipedia. I use it a lot. <laughs> and um, so I personally learned about this mycobacterium vaccae thing when I was reading the big conservation lab by Dr. Mordecai, Mordecai Ogata, who's a very good speaker. And I went on to, I went on to Wikipedia to read more about it. And I found this entry that just listed that it was a family bacteria lives naturally in the soil and it originates from uh, the Latin word cow because it was first cultured from cow dug in Austria. And it didn't mention anything about this particular strain of this mycobacterium being found in Uganda and only found because the locals told anyone about it. So I went ahead and edited that entry um, because it is important that we actually give credit to indigenous people when they give us their own knowledge. So moving on, uh, some indigenous scientific concepts that people already knew about before Western science sort of put a name to them. You got keystone species, you have ecological succession, you have intermediate disturbance, you have ecosystem. One interesting fact is that a lot of the time the word in indigenous languages, the word for land or earth is actually a word that translates more closely to ecosystem. It's not just earth, it's earth and humans and animals and air and trees and water and all the connections between those different components. It's all underneath that idea, that one single word of earth. You also have indigenous people using ecological indicators to figure out when certain things were gonna happen in the environment. And they also knew about source habitats and the need to protect these habitats. As for management techniques, there is a ton of management techniques, obviously that indigenous people knew about. In their drive to sort of manage their environment to purposes. I'm gonna cut this. <laughs> uh, to uh, in their manage uh, in their effort to manage the environment towards their own purposes. I'm probably not gonna cut that. I want you guys to see me make mistakes. Um, so yeah, rotating harvest regimes and letting fields fight lie fallow and letting habitat patches and the animals within sort of recover from hunting. You have selective harvest. You have the protection of vulnerable life history stages and source habitats, as I mentioned. You have the idea of managing landscape, an entire landscape for patchiness or managing an entire watershed to protect the, the quality of water and the quality of the forest that all, your, all of your resources are coming from. Um, so when we go to monitoring resource abundance, uh, we have shamans of the Tucano people in Colombia. Uh, they schedule random hunting excursions, and during that time, they'll actually the shamans will actually sort of um, count and dis, uh, determine which animals are probably being hunted a little bit too much, and animals that they might need to like back up off of, and uh also determine what kind of species they can also hunt while they're switching from that possibly overexploited resource they knew about monitoring res resource abundance like i mentioned they also knew about the use of fire which is a very complex science it requires the knowledge of how animals and plants are affected by fire how intense and hot and frequent the fires should be um, to get the kind of habitat that they want and the kind of results that they wanted. 
Uh, it requires knowing the use of fire breaks and barriers and other methods of fire control and then a lot more. So one example of a management technique was uh, from this paper. Um, and I think this is where we stopped last Thursday. But basically what the indigenous people would do after they cleared land was that they would plant this native plant, which was sort of like a shrubby tree. And in that way, they stopped that, that cleared patch of land from being overtaken by invasive bracken fern, which were a lot harder to clear once they actually wanted to start um, farming in that area. And then we come to adaptive management techniques, um, which if you are in wildlife or in forestry, you should probably know by now. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what, what year you guys are. I'm thinking you guys are probably juniors and seniors. So you should probably know about this, but just in case you don't, an adaptive management technique is basically just being, um, just sort of going with the flow, rolling with the punches. So what you do is you get an active management technique. So for example, if you want it to grow more pine in a certain area for logging, um, and you're not growing as much pine as you want, you might say, okay, perhaps we'll plant um, five seedlings per square meter. I'm not sure what pine plantations do, so don't get on me about that, but I'll plant five seedlings per meter, square meter, and then um, that's an acting the management technique. You'll monitor their spots. Okay, so all these seedlings aren't growing up to be the height in the girth that they should be to make them useful for logging. Um, that's monitoring the response. And then you adapt the management. Maybe I should plant um, fewer seedlings per square meter compared to more. And this uh, supposedly came out, this idea supposedly came out in um, 1964 uh, from Carl Walters, who wrote this book. in the adaptive, uh, adaptive management of renewable resources. But uh, indigenous people knew about this way before then. It's really interesting because, um, so one quote that was in the intro of this book was that uh, man has proved remarkably adept at developing harvests for renewable resources, but he has shown considerably less skill in devising schemes for sustaining the harvest over a period of time. Whereas uh, it seems that indigenous people have obviously been able to do that for thousands of years. Okay. Um, another concept slash technique that indigenous people have sort of known about for thousands of years is the idea of sustainability. Um, so this is from, let's see, what is it, what is it? This is from the uh, Iroquois Confederacy. They had an oral constitution way before um, the United States had it. And actually, I, it's, the United States actually based our constitution the United States based our constitution off of the oral constitution from the Iroquois Federation. Um, and also Iroquois is another name for Haudenosaunee, which we're basically on their native land right now. Um, unseated, uh, basically stolen from them. But so they had this oral constitution dating back to the 1200s and the United States used this oral constitution as a framework for our constitution right now. And they have uh, quotes about having always in view this idea of not just the present, but taking care of the area and the land and the culture for generations way into the future. And it comes back to this idea of seven generation sustainability. 
basically using the resources in a way that seven generations from now, it will still be there. So basically when it comes to management techniques, um, indigenous people have already done a lot of the things that Western science claims to have discovered in the first place. Now, just to finish this off, take away points, uh, indigenous people knew about all these management techniques and ecological concepts. Um, this knowledge is, was often passed down through generations, through legends, stories, uh, cultural customs, oral telling, basically. And Western science doesn't often credit indigenous knowledge. Uh, so all of this stuff that I put in the lecture, I learned about when I was making it. <laughs> And I've been in this field for about eight years. So I never knew any of this stuff before I was making this lecture. And I just find it interesting. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we move on? 